Hello, Hillside. Hey, we are so excited you're here to join us at church today. I have with me the amazing Sally Stafford, and she is going to open us up with prayer. Thank you, Stephen. Father, Father God, we come before you humbly asking for you to join us in this coming hour. Father, change us. Change us through the music that we sing praise to you. Change us through your holy word that we study and read. Father, change us from the inside out. Father, please make us into people that are more kind, more compassionate, more loving towards others. We are your body, Lord, and we want to represent you well. Father, we also pray for the, our brothers and sisters down at the park, Lord. I pray that they would be a light to people who are living in darkness. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do today. May all the glory go to your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you'd stand and join us in worship today, we're going to praise.
give praise. <laughs> praise that we got some words. Yeah. <laughs> we can all sing together to you.
Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word, your spirit, your truth, and for wanting us to be in your family. We give you all the praise today, this morning, this evening, this week, this year, this life, and we give it all the praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Hillside. Go ahead, grab a seat. We are so happy you're here. My name is Stephen Weissong. I am the pastor of student ministries here at Hillside. And there's someone waving to me in the back. Hello, you back there. Uh, hey, at this point in the service, there's Carly Anderson right over there, our amazing children's director. If there are any kids in K through fifth grade, now is your time. It's your moment to go to Carly and experience the wonders of downstairs kids' ministry. Have fun out there. Okay. Hey, if you didn't get a chance, we would love for you to have the bulletin, and you can see all of the amazing things that we have upcoming here at Hillside. You can follow along with the, I just think it's going to be a phenomenal message today from Pete Stafford, so you can follow along there. So if you don't have a bulletin, we have people in the back that can help you. If you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand, and they will get that to you. I'm going to highlight really quick some things that we have going on, some things that have happened here at Hillside. The first thing is something that we did a couple weeks ago. Well, I didn't do it, but amazing women in our church did this thing. They did a walk around Lafayette Reservoir. There was about 25, and they did this amazing prayer exercise. It was led by Janice. Uh, thank you so much, Jan uh, Janice Jensen. Uh, I want to make sure I got the name right. Thank you for leading through that prayer walk, Janice, and all the women who went to that. Uh, next up for women, there is a game night happening. Woo, woo. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. It's Friday, July 26th. There's a game night. If you would like to sign up for that, you can go onto our church website, or you can talk to Sarah Lefko Park and reach out and find out more details for that. Next up, we have something that's involving the whole church. It's our backpack drive that we do every year to help the Monument Crisis Center kids at risk. We, we stuff backpacks full of all the different supplies that they need for the upcoming school year. So if you are interested, this drive is almost coming to a close. You need to make sure you bring your backpack by Sunday, July 14th, and you can purchase all of the things and then bring the backpack here, or you can make a donation online by July 8th to help cover the cost of a backpack. And then we have a team that goes and takes the backpacks to the Monument Crisis Center to hand them out. It is a really cool thing that we do here at Hillside. The other opportunity, it's from Tony Collins, and it's this ministry. It's called the Hands and Feet Ministry. It's a great organization. It's made up of people from churches throughout the East Bay, and they put on different events to try to be the hands and feet of Jesus for those uh, that need it. They develop relationships. They meet physical needs, and they have some, I'm calling them park parties, uh, it's in Cambridge Park from 6 to 8 p.m. on July 9th, 10th, and 11th. And there will be dinner, games, and fun. And if you want to volunteer to be part of that team, you can contact Tony Collins or uh, look at things on our website. The last thing is if you would like to stay up to date on all of the happenings here at Hillside, there's a Connect card in front of you, uh, in the front seat in front of you, that you can sign up uh, to be on our newsletter and get the weekly emails, and then you can drop that off in the offering box back there. And then now we're going to talk about the offering. We have an amazing opportunity to provide an offering to give through Hillside and all the amazing things that happen here. And you can take the envelope for offering, put it in the box. You can make a donation online. Let me just pray over our offering. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for all the gifts that you give us. Thank you that you have supplied our needs each where we're at. God, may we be good stewards and overseers and managers of what you have provided us, God. And may we just give from our hearts back to you all that you have given to us. Thank you for all the amazing things happening here at Hillside and what you're doing in this church and through this church to impact our community and world around us. Bless us as we give. Thank you for who you are and your awesome, awesome name. Amen. 
I, I said that in my mind. I didn't say it out loud. Uh, <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm going to invite up Dan, and he is going to bring up Randy Fishback, and they're going to tell you about something cool. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, good morning to all of you. Uh, in case you are, are new or newish, I'm Dan Seitz. I'm one of the pastors here at Hillside, and I'm sitting next to my friend uh, Randy Fishback, who, if you've been around the church for a while, you know very, very well. Uh, if you're new, Randy is a longtime hillside leader, uh, served in a million capacities, most recently, to use today's language, most recently as our director of global outreach, and did that really, really well for a long time. And uh, today, we're talking about something sort of related. Uh, I heard that you are heading off to Ukraine. And so I've invited you to come up right now without preparation to answer my, uh, my question of why you're going there. Uh, why are you doing this? Ukraine seems like kind of a strange place to visit right now. So what is the nature of this trip? Well, you said Ukraine. They told me Spain. So <laughs> I, 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 I've, now I've got to wrap my head around that. Um, yeah, so I have an opportunity to go with Hope International Ministries, acronym HIM, uh, into, into Ukraine and uh, minister to pastors and their um, spouses and their families. Basically, a hundred pastors and families will be coming in and um, being given uh, trauma care, trauma training, uh, get being given a time of respite and refreshment and encouragement because of all they're going through with the war-torn country and everything. And so this will be a week-long retreat that's completely free to them, to the attendees, which is really cool. And um, for the children, there's going to be a vacation Bible school or kids camp and um, all sorts of things. Just a team of six or seven of us going in and uh, just excited to try to be there. You probably wonder... Why me? I'm not a trained uh, trauma guy or anything like that, but uh, do have a little experience with uh, trafficked kids and, and, and trafficked uh, girls, and so um, God felt God's call to do this. Wow. So I'll get this straight. Uh, pastors in Ukraine, they are serving under very difficult circumstances, as we all know. Uh, they're trying to be faithful to care for their flock. Uh, many of them are under great pressure and struggling, and you and your team are going to provide a retreat for them to be encouraged and nourished. Do I have that right? Yeah, well said. It's better than I said it. I don't think it was better than you said it. I, I think that's fantastic. I really do. Um, I mean, I know how nourishing retreat experiences have been for me. And uh, before going on pastor's retreat, sometimes I've gotten so tired, I haven't even realized how tired I was. And then I go away, meet with other pastors, have people like you build into me, and I feel like a transformed person, able to come back and do what God has called me to do. So I think what you're doing is tremendous, and uh, what a joy to get to support you in it. I heard, too, that uh, a really distinguished leader from Hillside's past is involved in this project. Uh, so tell us who this is. Fill in the story for us. Well, I think a few of you will remember, more than a few of you will remember Pastor Doug Stevens and his wife Nancy. And that's kind of how this came about. Doug had done this previously, and I had expressed some interest in it. And I said, you know, I'd love to, to join you guys if it ever, you know, worked out or if God called you to to ask me to do that, and, and I got the old, uh, yeah, you know, I'll keep that in mind. It, it felt like a let's do lunch moment. Um, and so, uh, but I kept this in front of Doug a couple times. Then he called me in, in February and said, do you still want to go to Ukraine? And I said, I still feel led to do that if, if it's appropriate. So um, that's the connection. Uh, Doug has been a couple of times. Uh, Nancy got as far as Moldova, the country just to the west of Ukraine, and ministered there. But this is her first time going into Ukraine with uh, Hope International Ministries. And so uh, it's going to be really fun to, uh, to uh, serve alongside Doug. I had a brief chance to do that when he first left this church. When I joined him in San Diego as he was doing some church leadership restoration 
things. And so uh, we're getting back together, and I'm excited about that. So one thing about uh, Doug is that um, he's, he's a guy that makes you do stuff. I don't know if people remember here. He would always, I remember somebody was threatening to basically leave the church because they came up to me and they said, Doug is trying to make us do stuff. And I, and I thought, amen. <laughs> Perfect. You have a problem with that? So, so Doug is a big James 1.22 guy, be, be doers of the word, not hearers only. And he was really instrumental in my life in changing that around. In my early Christian years, I was all about head knowledge. I wanted to kind of just know all this stuff, know all this Bible stuff. Right. And then he turned that around or, or added to that and said, you know, let's, let's do all this Bible stuff. And so I'm just really pleased to be joining him and Nancy and the team. That's fantastic. Doing that. Yeah, remind me of the dates, if you did not say it. When are you going? So I leave this Saturday. This Saturday. And okay. I come back on July 19th. All right, we want to pray for you. How can we pray for you? Well, d before I get to that, and I, will, I do have some prayer requests, um, I want to thank the people who have contributed. First of all, the church, Hillside, my family, um, contributed out of their outreach, global outreach budget, yeah. and I just really am blessed by that. And then some of you, many of you actually individually, are supporting this. And th the great thing about... I, don't, I hate asking for money, but this was so easy because the money is going to pay the pastors and their families to attend. All of us that are going there are paying our own way, and all the money goes to make it a free experience for those being ministered to. So thank you for, uh, for doing that. I just want to applaud you guys for sharing in that. How can, how can you pray? Um, so there's one guy who's gone in every time, Pastor Leonid or Leo. Um, and he's not able to go in because Ukraine just instituted a law that if you were uh, born in Ukraine and you are, you can't leave the country if you're of fighting age. And so um, he was born in the Soviet Union when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, so not technically Ukraine, but his passport is stamped Ukraine. And he's been told, if you go in, you're probably not coming back out. And they've tried to write letters that try to express that he's been in the U.S. for all this time and wasn't technically born in Ukraine or whatever. So we're praying that, that God makes a way for Leo to come back in. He's done this before, and he's a real instrumental leader in this. And so that's specifically. And then just pray for the pastors and their, and their spouses and their families, that they would just be encouraged and refreshed and just ready to go back and and face all the, the trauma they face every day. Good. Can we do it right now? I would love it. Father, uh, we feel great excitement uh, over what you have called your servant Randy to do starting on Saturday. And uh, Lord, he has uh, been responsive to your call and you've called him to go, to be uh, an agent of blessing and encouragement to his uh, brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And we know you're going to use them. We thank you in advance for the way you're going to use them, but we ask just the same that uh, you would use Randy, you would use Doug, you would use Nancy, you would use everybody else on that team as instruments of your presence and your blessing to these pastors. We pray, Lord, it would flow right through them into the hearts of these pastors, and we pray that they would emerge from the experience deeply refreshed, uh, reconnected to their calling, confident in it, and better able to do the shepherding work that you've called them to do. And we pray that the, the, the benefit would just cascade out throughout the country, and who knows that it might even have peacemaking effects in a very, very broad way. Uh, Lord, we pray that you keep Randy safe and the rest of the team, uh, keep him healthy so that he's able to serve with his full strength and capacities again. And we're so grateful and we're looking forward to hearing the stories when he comes back. We love you. And we're so grateful for the way you use us to advance your purposes in this world. And we're reminded in this moment, you've called us all to do this or to do that and to go somewhere and help us all to be responsive to whatever that is this week. We love you so much. And we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Gosh, thank you so much, brother. Yeah. Bless you. Yeah. Stand up. And we're going to go into our mixer time. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to find somebody. Come on, stand up. 
Uh, you're going to find somebody you did not come with today. This is a, a chance to meet somebody new. And here's the question. Share something of great value that you have held in your hands. All right? Introduce yourself, say hello, learn a name, and have that conversation, and we'll reconvene in a few minutes. You come on back. We're going to continue in worship. I also just heard, uh, if you want to come on back, um, we're going to begin our worship. I just heard some really fun news that I wanted to share before we did our next worship set. I heard that Sam Worthington is in the house, which, which sounds exciting. I understand. Oh, hi. They're Livingston. Oh, I had this in my ear. Stan Livingston. Thank you so much. A missionary, correct? And we'll be um, out back saying hello to and I'll introduce myself as well. So.
I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses. The one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. For me, for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, oh God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the Lord. are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not faith Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my
your freeing hearts right now you are the same god you are the same god you touch the lepers then i feel your touch right now you are the same god you are the same Heavenly Father, you are the same God. And this morning, your people are gathered here and we are standing on your, faith, on your faithfulness. Yes. It's the only firm place, Lord, in this uh, upside down world that we can stand. You've been faithful to us. You've been faithful through the ages. Oh Lord, we need you. Yes. Oh Lord, we need you now. We want to have a real live encounter with you this morning. We want to hear your voice. We want to have you speak to us. Your servants are listening. Amen. Good morning, Hillside. It's great to be with you this morning. Hey, I want to take a moment to hear from you. I want to hear some of the responses that you gave to this morning's mixer question, something of great value that you've actually held in your hands. Children. Well, I'm sorry? Grandchildren. The Bible. Anything else? Cash. <laughs> that is great. Uh, this morning, we're in for a treat. We are going to um, look at a story about a man who actually held the greatest treasure that there is in his hands and he didn't even know it until a moment in time when he did, and then everything changed. We're in a summer series. Uh, we're going through these and considering these incredible prayers of our Bible, these fabulous encounters. Uh, our, our, our series is inspired by a book named, uh, called Daring to Draw Near. It's written by the late John White. And as with the book, uh, we are not going to be so much uh, looking at, uh, into how to pray, but we will be considering these encounters to understand what they reveal about the God to whom we pray. Wayne got us kicked off. Pastor Wayne got us uh, introduced to this series. He let us eavesdrop on these great conversations taking place between God and Abraham. This week, we have the pleasure of being a spectator of this epic encounter between God and, and Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Um, this encounter is the pivotal moment in Jacob's life. I see a group of my friends from our Monday men's group called Kairos, and at Kairos, we speak of these encounters as Kairos moments. They are moments when Time stands still. There are moments when God has our undivided attention and we're encouraged to ask questions like, God, what are you saying to me now? And God, what do you want me to do about it? So uh, let's read the account of Jacob's Kairos moment. It's found in Genesis chapter 32. We've printed, printed it in the inside of your bulletin. I'll be reading from the NASB version. And you, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can probably find some in the seats, um, underneath the seats in the rows in front of you. All right, from Genesis 32, beginning at verse 22. Now he got up that same night and took his two wives, his two female slaves and his 11 children and crossed the shallow place of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob 
was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was dislocated while he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have contended with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, what is it that you, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel. For he has said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel, and he was limping on his hip. Uh, to fully appreciate just how impactful this encounter is for Jacob, we have to go back and take a little bit of a look at what his life looked like leading into this incredible encounter. For Jacob, the drama in his life started really early. In fact, it started while he was still in the womb and then again at delivery. For, uh, Jacob was a twin. His brother's name was Esau, and his mother's name was Rebekah. And she notices a commotion going on inside her. So he, she asks God what this is all about. And in Genesis chapter 5, this is what the Lord says to her. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. And, the people will be strong, and, and one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And as promised, Jacob was not the first one out, but he was a close second. In fact, he was very close. This is what the scripture says in verse 26. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. This grappling of his brother's ankle became this early mark of Jacob's identity. In fact, um, his parents named him Heel Grabber which in Hebrew is spelled J-A-C-O-B, or something like that, you know what I mean. The twins could not have been any more different. Uh, Esau was what some would call a man's man. He was an outdoorsman. He was a hunter. He was, um, he was a impulsive character, and he had this ready, fire, aim approach to his life. Jacob was more domestic. Uh, he was more calculating. He was a schemer. And guess which one of the two boys was the father's favorite? Esau. Isaac saw more of himself in his rugged older son, and the guy was not afraid to show it off. He did not hide his favoritism at all. Do you see the seeds of tension brewing in this family? You've got sibling rivalry all the way back to the womb. You've got, you've got by custom and by fatherly favoritism, the, the blessing and the birthright belonging to the older, but the promise belonging to the younger. Now this story is 3,500 years old, so I don't expect that you would have any understanding of these kinds of family dynamics like favoritism <laughs> or, or sibling rivalry. So just do me a favor and use your imagination. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, in, Je in Genesis chapter 25, we learn how Jacob uses his brother's impulsiveness against him. And he buys the birthright from Esau for the purchase for the price of a bowl of soup. And in chapter 27, we learn how Jacob and how Rebekah work together and scheme together to help God along and make good on his promises. And they use disguise, and they use deceit, and they trick Isaac, who knows his death is imminent, who's failing in eyesight, and they trick him into giving the birthright and the blessing, not to the favored older son, but to the younger. As I was reviewing Jacob's life these last few weeks, um, it dawned on me that he reminds me of somebody I know. Uh, any guess? Yeah, me. <laughs> He reminds me of me. Um, I wouldn't want you to call me a deceitful schemer. Maybe a strategic planner would be better. 
And I certainly wouldn't want you to call me a control freak. Um, although some people that know me well just laughed very hard right there. Um, yeah, I, from time to time, I still find myself um, trying to give God a helping hand to earn the things that he's already promised to me. Hmm. So we learn um, how old Esau feels about this birthright going to the younger brother in Genesis 27 and verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob and said to himself, the days of mourning are near, then I will kill my brother. So what does, what does Jacob do? He gets out of town. He flees. He heads north, all the way out of the promised land, all the way across the Euphrates River. Basically, he's retracing the steps that his grandfather stepped, but, but in the other direction. He's heading out of the promised land and not into the promised land. So he travels 500 miles to the north. He uh, ends up in the city of Haran. There he meets Rebekah's brother, his uncle Laban. And good old uncle Laban gives Jacob a taste of his own scheming medicine. He tricks Jacob into not just marrying his younger daughter, whom Jacob thought was more attractive, but he also gets him to marry his oldest daughter. Rather sordid tactics about how he did that. I won't talk, go into that detail at this time, if you know the story. And he also tricks him into giving him, Jacob giving him 20 years of service as opposed to the seven that were originally agreed. And in spite of Laban's scheming, God greatly blesses Jacob. He makes good on a promise that he gave to Jacob in a dream back in Genesis chapter 28. He gives him children and he gives him flocks and he gives him donkeys and he gives him camels. And he promises to be with God. Uh, God promises to be with him and to bring Jacob back safely. And Jacob has the most ridiculous response to this promise. It's, it's in Genesis 28. I'll paraphrase it for you. It's kind of a conditional vow. vow. Basically, he says, if you will keep me safe and if you will um, meet me and my material needs, then I will make you by God. Jacob's relationship with God is not one of trust and fellowship. It's all about religious acts. It's all about negotiations. But God wants more from Jacob. He wants Jacob's heart, and he's determined to get it, and he's not afraid to wrestle over it. You know what happens when you spend 20 years scheming and fighting people that are scheming you and running away from your fears? You get tired. You get tired, right? And this is what God says to him in another dream at this point. Jacob, now arise, leave this land and return to the land of your birth. And Jacob, this time, he responds positively. He obeys. He somehow manages to sneak himself and all of his goods and belongings and family out of town before Jacob, I'm sorry, before Laban sees that he's gone. And secondly, for the first time recorded in scripture, he actually prayer, prays a genuine prayer. But that's not our Kairos moment. It's a great prayer. It's a fit prayer with faith and humility and trust. And he, and he even, which is a good, a good habit, he prays God's promises back to him. So this brings us back to the, uh, to the final details preceding this Kairos moment that we'll look at in a second. He learns that Esau is, and his 400 men are on their way. And of course, that, that creates a great fear and dread in Jacob's life. He sends messengers down to Edom, where, Je where Esau is, to let e Esau know that he's on his way home and that he's been greatly blessed with treasure and that he plans to share that blessing with him. And he devises a plan to bribe Esau. He's gonna take portions of his wealth. He's gonna send him over in waves. He's gonna have messengers along with those waves uh, speaking words of appeasement to Esau. 
This brings us back to our text. Thank you for letting me go down memory lane so we're ready to hear the story again and what it means to us. He's at the place of the ford of Jabbok. It's the place of crossing over. It's the place of no turning back. And after he uh, sends the waves across, you'll see it in your text in 22 and 23, and as he wakes up in the middle of the night and he sends his family across and any remaining bless, bless, uh, of his goods, he's then all alone. So now we're ready to make some observations, and after that, we'll try and draw a few lessons out of this uh, epic battle that we're about to look at uh, a little bit more closely. The first thing that surprised me was who picked the fight? That was my first uh, surprise. Who picked the fight? God, God picked the fight. Our text says a man wrestled with him. The man was the first one to lay hands in the wrestling match, not Jacob. Keep that in mind if you're daring to draw near that God's not afraid to get into a wrestling match with us, and he's not afraid to start one. Um, second thing notice is how long this match lasted. It says that Jacob got up in the middle of the night in verse 22, and in verse 24, it says that the wrestling match lasted until daybreak. There is not a more exhausting activity in sport than a wrestling match. They, wrestling matches typically go in three-minute intervals because people are completely exhausted. But this wrestling match goes on all night long. It goes on for hours. I was speaking with Gloria this morning about the, this mystery man, this, uh, this man that uh, some uh, commentators suggest rather convincingly that this is a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord Jesus. Others suggest that it's an angel. What our text says is that it's God. Check it out, verse 28, the man speaking here. For you have contended with Elohim, You've contended with God. And Jacob in verse 30, sa 30 says, I have seen Elohim. I have seen God. At some point in the match, there emerges a sense of urgency. Did you notice it? Verse 25, as daybreak approaches, the man sees that he's not able to pre prevail against Jacob. So notice carefully, the Kairos moment inside of this epic encounter is found in verse 25. Verse 25 doesn't say that the man wrenched Jacob's leg. It doesn't say that he twisted Jacob's leg. It says that he, and the Hebrew word is naga. He touches Abraham's hip. And when he touches Abraham's hip, his hip dislocates. This touch will be the, t the moment that everything changes. Jacob is no longer wrestling against God. What is he doing now? He's holding on for dear life. If you've ever had a finger or a thumb or a shoulder or a hip dislocated, you know how excruciatingly painful it is. Jacob is tired, Jacob is in great pain, and he is now holding on to God. He's no longer wrestling against him. God initiated this fight because he wanted more. Now Jacob is refusing to end this fight because now he wants more. He now knows what he has. He's hanging on to God. It's as if God's saying, uh, Jacob is saying to God, God, now I'm figuring it out. This encounter is bringing me a revelation. I haven't been wrestling with my dad my whole life. I haven't been wrestling with my brother my whole life. I've been wrestling against you. You've the, you're the one I've been resisting all along. Jacob thought his problems were his, his, created by his dad and his brother and his uncle Laban. The, re, the reality was that Jacob, what he was really striving for, back to our mixer, he actually had in his hands. Now he knows what he wants. He wants to experience 
of the reality of God, that same God that we were singing about just a few minutes ago. And I want you to notice how this text hammers this point home. In verse 26, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Verse 29, please tell me your name. In other words, I want to know you. Verse 30, I have seen God face to face. In other words, I, I want to see you. There's things in my life that I desperately want. There are problems in my life that I want God to desperately solve for me. But what I really need more than anything else, I desperately want to have real live encounters with the living God. One more observation, and then we'll make a few quick lessons and we'll be done. Notice the extent of this Kairos moment transformation. Notice how complete this transformation is. Jacob is no longer pushing God away. He's now clinging to him. Jacob gains this new revelation. He now knows what he's been after. He now knows what the blessing is. He now knows that God is his reward. He gets a new walk. He'll forever walk with a noticeable limp. He gains new revelation. He gets a new name. Uh, names speak powerfully in the pages of our Bible. Uh, the Apostle Peter was first Simon until he got a revelation from God and he confessed to Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. These name changes in the Bible, they always seem to happen at Kairos moments. Just go ahead, check it out. See if you don't notice the Kairos moments in them. Um, for example, uh, the Apostle Paul was first Saul until he was heading to Damascus and Jesus, speaking of wrestling matches, matches he tackles him on the five-yard line. And he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So he gets a new name. He's not going to be called heel grabber anymore. Actually, he continues to be called heel grabber even after this story. He's still got a lot of Jacob in him that he's got to get, get rid of. But more and more as the story goes on, he starts to be called Sarah. Sarah is a comp, I'm sorry, uh, it's not Sarah, it's Israel. All you Sarahs in the room, the, the, the Israel is a, it's a compound word. There's two words. There's Sarah and there's El. Sarah means to contend, means to, um, um, means to have power, to rule, to contend. And El, of course, means God. So there's two ways you can take the meaning of Jacob's name. If you are speaking of, of this man being a truth about God, he is, God is the God who wrestles. If you're speaking about a truth about Jacob himself, Jacob is the one who is ruled by God. Here's your first fill-in. Real encounters with God produce real transformation. So what are the lessons? What are the lessons for us to learn in this epic encounter? First lesson, encounters that forever change us happen when we are all alone. Now, there may be an exception to that rule, but if you think about it in your life, the times when God has spoken to you, the time when time stands still, it's typically when we're alone. Give Jacob credit as he was doing all the planning and preparing to meet this brother Esau for this epic battle, he sent everybody across. He created space so he could be alone with God. I think he did that because he knew that he was going to face his brother the next day. He knew that uh, he might be killed by his brother or that God might spare him, but regardless, he was going to first have an opportunity to speak with God. The, inter the interesting thing about this time alone, it's actually what created the Kairos moment. The Kairos moment wasn't going to be when he faced Esau. The Kairos moment was going to happen when he was alone. The time when he gets together with Esau finally, it's a nothing burger. 
Esau doesn't come up to him and uh, try and kill him. He comes up to him and he hugs him and he kisses him and they start crying together. You can check that out in Genesis 33. You know, all that worry, all that fret for all those years and poof, God just deals with it. Isn't that often how it happens? And he deals with it in a way that we would never have imagined. Uh, one more confession while I'm making confessions today. I also tend to be a bit of a worry wart. I'm trying to get better at that. Um, I'm trying to worry less and trust God more. You know, calling myself a worry wart is really an easier way of saying that I commit the sin of not trusting God as my Heavenly Father. So, next question, next lesson. The real problem of our life is that we resist God. Jacob's real problem wasn't his brother, it wasn't his father. Jacob resisted God, and that leads us to our next fill-in. And this one's the tough one. God almost always has to wound us to show us the real problem of our life. The fill-in is God draws near to us in our woundedness. I said this is the hard part of the lesson, but I'm not afraid to talk about it because I know it's true of me. God tells me who my true reward is and he speaks loudest to me in times of pain or wounds. And I know many of you here this morning, and I know many more in the church that, are, that aren't here this morning, I know your stories too. And you've told me a little bit about your wounds and pain and you've told me that this is true of you also. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts it in the problem of pain. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasure. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts to us in our pains. It is the megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes God touches us in our hip. Sometimes he permits other pains to come our way, but they are always wounds of grace. They're always allowed or given by a heavenly father who's looking for us to see him as our great reward. Next fill in, memorialize transformational encounters. When God orchestrates a Kairos moment, those are great opportunities to take the time to memorialize it. How was this Kairos moment memorialized for Jacob? What do you see? How was it memorialized? What? I'm sorry? A new name. He gets a new name. What else? He gets a new walk. He gets, he's going to walk, walk with a limp. What else? Yes. What does he call it? He calls it Peniel. Peniel means um, facing God. Thank you, Carol. One final lesson, God draws near to us in his meekness. Hmm. I wanted to use the word weakness because it starts with a W like woundedness does, but my editorial staff would have nothing of it. Of course, that's my wife, Sally, over there who, who prayed this morning. And she's right. She's always right. She was right. There's a better word. There's a better word. It's meekness. Think about it for a second. What do, you, what do you need in order to have a wrestling match that goes on for hours? You need to have two opponents of equal strength. And that's exactly what Jacob had, thought he had, until God touched his hip. And then all bets were off. Then he realized whose hands he was in. He was in the hands of the most powerful one, the almighty one. That God could have just grabbed Jacob by the back of his neck, thrown him down and said, stop resisting me. And the match would have been over. And God likely would have lost Jacob. Does this story remind you of any other stories? 
a story where God comes in meekness. He comes in, excuse me, in gentleness to try to woo us and win us over to himself. It's the story of the gospel. And it's expressed in the theme verse of our previous series, the glory quest. It's expressed, you know the verse, it's the one we all memorized because Dan told us to remember, right? Right? All right, uh, band, you can come up. Um, here's the verse, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He made himself meek by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus gently came to us. He came gently and meekly so he could prevail to win our hearts. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for coming to us, appearing to us in gentleness and meekness. Thank you for your being inviting and approachable and welcoming. And now we praise you, Jesus, as the one who now reigns in authority, in power, in glory. Jesus, your name, it stands above all names, all dominions, all powers. Your name stands above them all, and you are holy forever.
So where are you at this morning? Are you embracing Jesus or are you still resisting him and pushing him away? Are you resenting the wounds and the very painful circumstances in your life? Are you resenting God for them? Or are you daring to draw near? You've got some people, some wonderful people that are going to be up here and stationed in the back who would love to pray with you this morning. Maybe this is a moment in time where you want to change the trajectory of your life. Prayer is the best place to start when you want to do that. Pastor Dan asked me to tell you that he and I will be in the back of the room. And if any of you are new to Hillside, we would love to have the opportunity to introduce ourselves to you. Here's your exhortation. No playing games with God this week. We are going after real live encounters with the real live God, the living God. Have a great week and you are dismissed.